vehicle charging strategy this afternoon. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel uh, that are joining us. We've got loads of questions to whittle through um, and we're really looking forward to getting your insights. So do ask, use the ask a question section or the live chat section. Um, and we'll be making sure that we've got a couple of polls as well to get uh, to get some feedback on. Um, and we'll have a sort of good Q&A session right at the end um, as we go through the session. So hopefully lots to, to get engaged in and make sure we're answering your questions. But uh, to kick off, um, let me introduce the, the panel we've got today. Uh, we've got Councillor Rosina Chowdhury, Cabinet Member for Sustainable Lambeth and Clean Air. We've got Roland Potter, Managing Director for the, and ex for the Executive Consultancy Services Limited. And we have Perrin Moon, who's the Interim CEO of Believe, taking over from me today. Um, and hopefully we've got Peter McDonald. Uh, he was he was here a second ago and he, seem, he may seem to have dropped off, but I'm hoping he's going to rejoin us at any second. So uh, hopefully Peter can uh, be part of the panel conversation as well. So without further ado, let me dive into our first question for the panel. Um, and that is, what is your view on government policy around the rollout of electric vehicle, electric vehicle charging points? And how much of an impact do you think it is that uh, we potentially are behind our target of the 300,000 the government has set ourselves uh, by 2030? Who would like to proffer a first opinion on that? And um, we'll make sure that we, we give time for everyone. I'm happy to, uh, to proffer an opinion. Awesome. Um, so look, uh, ultimately, uh, if we think about what we're trying to achieve here, we're trying to reduce CO2 emissions and the overall impact on climate change. Um, but the 3,000, 300,000 uh, target is, is a government ambition. Um, and uh, what I think is, is relatively widely accepted is that we are well behind where we need to be nationally. Um, not just in terms of the overall numbers, but also in terms of the type of vehicle charge points that is available um, throughout the network. Um, and we have, you know, we have to make the transition to, to, to EVs viable um, for uh, consumers so that we can accelerate the process. It really is the, the kind of case that um, if you build it, they will come. Um, but we need to, in my view, need to take a more of a blended approach to, to the infrastructure. It isn't just a numbers game. Uh, it's about making sure we have the right charge points in the right locations, the right speed of charge points in the right locations. Um, we can't have uh, a race to a number if it means that the infrastructure doesn't support the needs of local residents and also people who are um, moving into a local authority from, from outside. Um, and this is why, uh, yes, there's a focus on more urban areas, but it's really, really important in my view that we make sure that nobody's left behind and that we look at uh, areas in more rural parts of the country and areas where there are high levels of deprivation and make sure that, um, that, the, that we, have, we end up with a truly national network uh, and at the moment, uh, understandably, because if you think about um, the demand for EVs, it is, it is um, higher in, in more urban areas. Um, but if we just chase a number, uh, we won't necessarily end up with a network that's fit for the 21st century and for that vital transition to um, away from petrol and diesel vehicles. And we know that 2030 is a, is a current deadline um, for the, the cessation of the sale of new um, uh, petrol and diesel vehicles. And, you know, that's, that's only, you know, seven years away, less than seven years away. Uh, and if you look at the, the current network we've got, um, it seems like we have got a long, long way to go in a relatively short uh, period of time. Um, and that, and the requirement is for, for both the industry and local authorities to to work much, much more closely together to accelerate that that process. Excellent. Thanks, yeah. Perrin. Uh, Rosina, in terms of that process, Perrin's obviously touching on the fact that this is specifically in, in dense urban areas is about making sure that the residents, or the, ser the residents are serviced, if you like, but, but clearly in a, in a city area like Lambeth, you've obviously got a whole bunch of other factors you're trying to consider in the mix. Not EV charging is just one of those. So how, how does that kind of play in in terms of the goals that you're setting yourself as well? 
Yeah, so, you know, we're thinking about um, modal shift, sustainable mobility, getting people to cycle more, scoot more, wheel more, um, and, and creating much more livable spaces. Um, and, you know, in Lambeth, we don't see electric vehicles as, as the panacea, um, you know, because we still need to think about road danger. We, set, we have one of the highest levels of um, you know, uh, stats when it comes to killed and serious injury. Um, and so, you know, we, we need to think about speeding as well. That's that's another issue. But just going back to uh, Perrin's point um, um, about um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the whole rollout of electric vehicle charging points, you know, we very much in Lambeth, it's very much about it's it's about demand led you know where 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 are the bits in the borough where there there is a there's a higher demand and we'll look to that and it'll be a very strategic approach so we're not just rolling that we do have a, a strategy and we do have um you know numbers of ev charges of various and um, charging levels speeds uh that we'll be putting out but it's much more looking at where they're needed um because we you know we we understand that you know ideally we want to we want to reduce traffic um, but we do know and understand that not everyone is going to be able to move their business to an e-cargo bike or be able to cycle or walk everywhere. So, And there will be a need for people to use their cars. And so we're trying to get, you know, we're trying to make it easier for people to move away from fossil fuel to electric vehicles and EV charging points will um, play a large part in that. But they're, they're, not, the, that they're not the only solution. Excellent, thank you. And Roland, um, from your experience uh, in, in, in this regard, what's your view as to, um, I guess, not only is the government the government target, but the fact that we're, we're way off from seemingly being able to, to hit that at the moment, what's the impact potentially for, for residents and users of, of being off, off, the, uh, off the pace in terms of that infrastructure rollout today? For me, I think there's too much noise and confusion possibly led by the government strategy by just giving a number, and Perrin pointed out, it's not just about the number; it's about the the, the quality and and as Rosina said, where it's cited and, and the purpose. Um, I think my my position, and I'll state it and be opinionated, and we'll see what comes back from that. But I don't see that it's achievable under the current government strategy. If you look at some of the reports where it says there's an investment requirement of between eight and eighteen billion between now and 2030 network to be 300,000 that's not going to come from government funding so it tends to be uh, almost like uh, and I've heard this said when I was head of transport for a combined authority that is it a government-led strategy and delivery or is it the government that's going to wait for the market to, to build the network a bit like um, the first petrol stations were horse and cart um, repairers that then decided to put a petrol pump outside the thing and then cars came along so it's the market that's going to drive the thing not the government in my view but there's complications and i think there's another report that says 75 percent of electric vehicle owners will charge at home um that's definitely not going to be the case in lambeth i would imagine or inner cities that percentage is not going to be the case and yet um i think we are going to have independently owned vehicles for many years beyond 2030 and and that will be the case and we need a network that enables people both within the local area but although also those that are coming in and coming out again um so i charge at home uh, but my vehicle i get about 230 miles out of it which is great but if my journey is more than 230 miles i need a charger network that i can rely on that i can plug into and uh, and go um and and that is becoming more challenging at times because they're starting to fill up and people are queuing at them. So this is a challenge that we've got to encounter. The impact, to answer your question, Neil, is that people will hear experiences that are negative, mm. no matter how negative, how bad the impact for that individual was. And when they're looking to change their car, continue to choose something alternative to it yep. until they can't do that. Um, so I think there needs to be certainly a review in government if they're going to stick to that target in terms of the funding strategy or relax some of the 
challenges for local authorities in terms of planning and some of the challenges for local authorities in terms of strategy, etc., to enable the marketplace to put the investment in believe. Excellent, Roland. I think there's a, you've, you've raised a, an interesting point there, which is um, around the speed of delivery, because certainly uh, from my perspective as, a, as, as equally as electric vehicle driver, um, and, and we see it too often, don't we, in, in terms of the news stories and certainly the, the negative media that wants to, to, to uh, bash EVs, you know, there's, all, there's a relentless number of stories. In terms of getting that charging infrastructure out there, um, it feels a little bit like if we don't do it quickly enough, actually, we, we have a potential impact on delaying adoption, which is clearly not not what any of us want to achieve. And Peter, thank you for joining us from 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 Croydon. Hopefully, the, the internet connection stays up for the <coughs> this time. Hi, uh, yes, um, thank you. Apologies for the uh, the absence, but uh, no problem, no problem at all. I don't, I don't... New office, I moved back to the old floor. <laughs> Well, look, thank you very much for joining us, Peter, as well. So second second question, um, and just, just picking up on your point there, Roland, in terms of um, what could, what do we think could be done to, to increase the speed of, of uh, rolling out charge points? Uh, because as you say, Roland, it's clear we're, we're behind the target, whatever the, whatever the right number is, we're behind where we need to be because we constantly hear feedback that, you know, that there isn't enough infrastructure in the right places. As you say, Roland, we're having more and more instances now where there are queues forming. Uh, and people can't get onto a charge point. Um, who would like to give us a, an opinion on that, Peter? It, whilst your internet connection's up, do you want to do you want to start off on that one? Okay, thank you. Um, well, there is a fresh round of low emission vehicle infrastructure Levi grant funding, um, so that's a pretty good place to start at the moment. Um, the, the the deadline in London, at least, has been extended till tomorrow but it might have been the 26th of may for everybody else um one of the things that i was going to mention was that you might sort of feel that you've got to have the grant but certainly for locations where there's likely going to be a good use of ev charging there are plenty of good charge point operators out there who are bringing their own cash uh, or, or other capital with them so don't despair uh, start somewhere. And I think it's a really good message, isn't it? I mean, we've, we've had so many conversations with, with local authorities up and down the country who, who almost want to make sure that they've got the strategy absolutely perfect, that it's, that it's you know, the Nirvana is painted out there and it's, it's not going to change. And we all know that this market is fast moving. The number of cars coming into the marketplace is a fast moving. The number of charge point operators is fast moving. It's a very dynamic market. Um, and uh, certainly our view, I think, is, look, don't, don't try to get the strategy perfect, but I think that's quite a good opportunity, uh, actually, Jack, if you can uh, get the first poll up and running in terms of the first poll question, that'd be great, because I think it touches on that. And, and whilst we're doing that, uh, Perrin, what's your perspective in terms of how do we go about trying to expedite the, the rollout of, of charging points nationally? Well, um, as a, uh, a councillor myself until three weeks ago, um, I just wanted to make clear I stood down, I didn't lose. Um, I, I, I understand really intimately the challenges that local authorities face um, around around EV infrastructure rollout. Um, you know, we know it's a matter of fact that there have been 60% plus cuts to, 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 to local government um, over the course of the last decade. Um, and the result of that is that officers are picking up all sorts of, um, of challenges and extra responsibilities. Um, to, to take on. Um, and from a belief perspective, we're, we're, we're also very, very aware um, that one of the biggest challenges facing uh, local authorities is time. Uh, it's, a, it's as simple as that. It's a, you know, it's a massive factor um, to, to ensure that uh, officers uh, and members and councillors are given uh, access to the time that's required to, to develop effective strategies. Um, and that's why you know, industry needs to step up, uh, businesses like Believe need to step up and support where we possibly can uh, local authorities in the development of their, of their strategies. We don't, you know, we don't um, you know, impose, um, but, you know, we have a, a, a large number of people who are, who are intimately involved with developing strategies and will offer advice 
um, come what may. And, and, and unless we have that focus on uh, supporting local government, local authorities in the development of their strategies, or um, uh, there's a change of heart and it, and it is encouraging um, that there's now funding for local authorities to support with resource, albeit, in my view, you know, pitifully small, um, we, we're going to really end up with a situation where um, we've got overworked officers who are desperately, you know, they know that they need to be developing strategies, but they're juggling a whole range of different responsibilities. Um, and that's, that's a challenge we say, we, we see um, day in, day out. Um, so so I'm, I'm very, very sympathetic um, coming from where I've recently come from to the, to the challenges that are, that are faced. And, and as I say, it's, it's, it's up to the industry to support local authorities where, where we possibly can and where local authorities are, are willing to engage. Obviously, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different priorities facing um, all, all sorts of different local authorities in different areas. Um, but there is resource and support out there for local authorities that, that, that need it. Excellent. And, and as you say, uh, Perrin, and, and as, as, um, as Peter's pointed out, obviously with the Levi funding, uh, it feels like that's almost now at a point where it's being uh, ready to be accessed by local authorities. I just wanted to share the results of the first poll that we've, we've gone through. The first question we asked was, do you have a completed EV charging infrastructure strategy? Um, and the results were that 91% of those who voted said that they didn't have one, uh, and 9% uh, said they did. And I guess I'm interested, Roland, if I come to you first, are you surprised by that number, that, that such a high percentage have ha have no strategy in place at this point in time? Not at all. And I think it goes back to what Perrin said about pressures on resource within local authorities. You'll find, uh, I think it's probably fair to say across the majority of the local authorities, the sustainability, the environment, the EV charger, you know, the EV charger bit is an, an element of a role that is far bigger. And very often that role is a part time role with other duties as well. And that's a challenge in itself. So, um, you know, the larger authorities with the healthier balances potentially or the regional authorities combined authorities, STBs may have funding more dedicated and the resources in which to do it. But uh, I'm not surprised to see that at all based on exactly what Perrin said. And I think um, I'd just um, like to add, if I may, Neil, I think there's also a little bit of confusion when you're an elected member with that as your portfolio, you're a portfolio holder across transport and a variety of transport. So EV is one element of it. And there's a lot of noise out there and it's very difficult to get to the core message as opposed to the noise. There's a lot of conflicting noise that elected members will hear. Um, and they're only human beings at the end of the day. They'll have their own views as well. But equally, your officer uh, with the challenges may be hearing lots of different noise as well and it's like well which which report do I read and which report do I believe and which step do I take and it can be challenging and and ultimately the more difficult we make it for people the less likely they are to get started on it very true uh Rosina how much of that sort of chimes a bell with with the challenges that you face in Lambeth not only in terms of getting that that strategy in place but also then the resource constraints that you undeniably face in terms of the, the hundreds of priorities that you're juggling on an everyday basis absolutely that all resonates I mean we've got the challenge of making uh you know our our council property and assets uh, we want to get to net zero operations uh, by 2030 um so and you know, this is just one part of it. EV charging is one part of it. It's a substantial part of it, and you know, and it and it, it, it sort of hangs off the bones of a, a, a newly launched curbside strategy uh, that we launched in January, um, which is about making sure that the curbside is used for more than just parking cars. Um, and if we're you know we following a citizens assembly recently where. You know, our, you know, our residents wanted to see 25% of it, 25% of the curbside taken uh, away from car usage and used for some, which then creates a bit of a squeeze on car parking. Um, so we've got to think about other ways of using that space. But on top of that, you know, the other thing to remember is in Lambeth, 40% of households don't have a car. 
um, and yet 94% of the space is used for car parking. So we, you know, as part of the car, um, our curbside strategy, we're saying, okay, well, when we have EV charging points, let's have them not on the pavement, but on, on the curbside. So that, so to think about strategically about that, you know, alongside tree planting or cycle storage, um, you know, we want to have bays for electric charging points, but they have to be, you know, we don't want them on the pavement because we have lots of, you know, I get uh, I get um, comments from people on social media saying, why is this, why is this car infrastructure on the pavement, which is meant for people? Um, so we've got to, you know, we, so there's lots of, lots of bulls that we're balancing and that we're trying to keep um, people on either side uh, happy, uh, but the curbside strategy, you know, we're seeing as as one way of uh, addressing that, making sure that, you know, EV infrastructure is accessible. And and this this again, the accessibility accessibility point is uh, is important as well because currently people who charge um, from their they have chargers in home cables coming out onto the pavement so we've got to you know officers have got to think about okay how do we deal with this you know this is this is going to be a trip hazard this is going to be an issue so what's what's our what's our policy around that that so that takes up sort of officer hours uh, considering how we deal with that and then there's issues around equality as well that we have to consider um you know the difference in in VAT charging you know whether you know if you're if you're lucky enough to have charging at home, you pay 5% VAT. If you're on street, then it's 20%. So, so all those uh, in, in, inbuilt inequalities that have to be considered. Um, and, and then, you know, staying on the uh, point of accessibility, um, you know, officers also have to think about what about blue badge holders? You know, how do we, how do we make um, EV infrastructure accessible for them? Um, you know, whether it's the, uh, uh, you know, whether they're able to plug it in, plug their car in, um, you know, using using the app or the public realm around them. So, you know, it's just, it, there's there's so many things to think about. Um, uh, and it's, it's so that, and yeah, and, and so officers do have to uh, tread a very kind of uh, fine line when it comes to just pushing stuff out because we know we've got to bring everyone with us. And if 40% if of your population don't have access to a car, then it's not really going to be high priority for them. So, but we do know that we want to move people away from fossil fuel. And by 2030, you know, we, we expect many more of our residents to be having electric vehicles. So we do need to, we, we know the challenges um, around that too. Sorry, that was a bit of a rambling answer. But I hope I managed to land some points there. <laughs> <laughs> Not all, Rosina. Uh, PJ, I'm going to come to you next because I think a lot of what, what Rosina has said there, you know, charging infrastructure, where it's placed, how it's placed, <coughs> citing the locations, all that kind of stuff, I think is, is stuff that you and I have talked about a long, for a long time now. Uh, but I equally wanted to pick up on, on the second vote that is still live at the moment. Um, Obviously, it reflects the conversation we just had that the fact that, that you know the biggest challenges to implement your strategy uh, way out in front is officer time. Uh, but I'm quite interested because the the the, the lowest scoring at the moment is member councillor pushback. Um, and to your point, Rosina, clearly it is about trying to make sure that we're building out this equitable network, this inclusive network for everyone, making sure that you know, regardless of uh, of location, um, people can access those charge points and giving everybody the opportunity to join that electric vehicle revolution. But um, Peter, I know that, you know, certainly from the conversations we've had and the work we've done together, um, you know, the, the sighting of those charge points is, is all critical, isn't it? It is, yeah, and I've made some of those comments in the live chat as well, in that we, in Croydon, have based our installations uh, entirely on resident and business requests. Um, and the government grants do require you to do that. Uh, Having said that, I do try to take a strategic overview uh, and look at where the existing uh, public and council installations are. And if I get a request in, um, I'll tend to prioritise those from, you know, taxi drivers, uh, because we're trying to ensure that those high mileage drivers have the option to go electric. Um, 
we will also look at the road and the area. Is this a place where other demand is going to come from? Um, I have, we've then worked with a number of different charge burn operators and they will each have their own um, methodology for assessing a location. Uh, finally, uh, if you're putting in seven kilowatt and above particularly, it's, it's a question whether the power is available in the road. Uh, we've got one or two examples uh, of where we've investigated and found there isn't seven kilowatts available. So we've gone back to looking at a lamp column charger instead. Um, where we've then installed, um, th th there seems to be a real disconnection between the places that I thought were going to be brilliant uh, and the ones that I thought, well, I'm pushing my neck out here. Um, and there's a real, it's always literally 50-50. The ones that I thought were going to be great, they're either at the bottom of the scale or the top. And the ones that I thought, I'm not sure about this, that half of them are little used so far and the other half are on the top. So hence my comment in the live chat that it only takes a few drivers, uh, as in EV drivers, uh, to be starting to use um, a charging point for it to become um, really very busy. Um, and just anecdotally, my cycle into work has goes past a couple of Believe uh, locations with four charging bays. And the first probably year that they were in, in one of those locations, yeah, sometimes I'd see a car charging. Well, last month, on four, if not six occasions, there were four cars charging as I cycled to work. Um, it, it can change very, you know, within a very short space of time, and the trajectory is up. So start somewhere. <laughs> yeah, start somewhere. Don't wait for the Nirvana. Well, let's just pick up on two of those points then: the availability of power, and then how people go around uh, finding the ideal locations to put those charge points. Um, I guess that's probably a good segue for you, Perrin, there to talk a little bit about how you go about doing both those things. Well, you know, that the, the availability of power is, is, is kind of what we live and breathe kind of every, every day. Um, it's, it's an absolutely critical part of the process and we work with local authorities once we get an idea of the sites that the local authorities would like us to consider. Um, right at the top of the, of, the, of the agenda, right at the top of the scoping process is to look at, at the power supply. Um, and, you know, we would love to have um, uh, all of the charge points, the relevant charge speeds in the, in the right locations. But we know across the country and um, uh, if, if we come, come outside London and, and look, I mean, I'm from, I'm from Cornwall. Um, and there are huge challenges around grid connection in Cornwall and in more rural areas. Um, it, it is a challenge um, and we have to work within the current structure that we, the current grid structure we, we, we have. Um, I would love to see a government initiative that really, you know, turbocharged the, uh, probably the wrong expression, but turbocharged the, uh, um, the, the, the upgrading of, of the grid. Um, we need to make sure that um, we've, we've, we've got these, these locations in place. And the, um, the other factor is that just because, you know, we, we, you, I mentioned it before, there's a requirement to not look at a, a, a one charge speed a panacea. It's really important to, to, to look at a blended approach of uh, EV charging across, across a local authority to ensure that, you know, destination charges have a different um, uh, a charge speed, assuming the, 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 um, the connection is there. Uh, and and, and that there, there are other charge speeds where where they're absolutely ideally sits, uh, suited to the to the usage. And I, I noticed in the chat somebody had mentioned that there are charge points uh, that have been rolled out um, where they're just not being used. And that's he, he, I think it was Colin. You know, it's, he's absolutely right. Um, and that's because um, in in many instances um, we've been checked. We as an industry and local authorities have been chasing a number. We haven't been looking closely enough at, at what is, you know, who is going to be using the charge point, at what times of day, um, what is the requirement, what's the dwell time at that particular location, 
uh, and making sure that we've got not just a number, but the right approach to, to each location to make sure that we've got, um, you, you know, the, whether it's, it's slow, fast, rapid or ultra rapid, we're making sure that we've got the right charge points in the right location. And, uh, and, and, and you know, we're, a, you know, we're, we're, a, we're an industry in its, in its infancy relatively. Um, so we are going to, there's going to be mistakes made. Um, but we have to, 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 to the point that, you know, Peter was making, if, if you build it, they will come, you know, if we, if you put the infrastructure in place, if you get started, um, if you, you know, you pilot, uh, putting in some, some, some charge points in particular locations to, you know, to, 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 to build a case, to build a business case, um, to, to develop your, your strategy, that's sometimes a, 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 a much more effective approach than, than waiting for the panacea, waiting for every, all of the ducks to be in a row, waiting for your Levi funding to come through. If you're, if you're, if you're waiting for every single um, duck to be in line, then we'll be waiting so long that we, you know, we, we, we won't be moving forward anywhere near as fast as we can. So I would encourage local authorities to, to pilot and test um, uh, um, particular sites within their um, uh, within their local authorities, so that they can, when when they do have the funding come through or the strategy all in place, there's a whole load of learning that's already been achieved during the course of that of that process, rather than just waiting for all the ducks to, 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 to align. Excellent. Thank you, Perrin. Um, Roland, sort of picking up on that point there, obviously, that the feedback from that last poll was that um, whilst we've already talked about officer time constraints being the biggest factor, the second most important factor then is funding. Based on your experience uh, in terms of, of, of the, um, uh, you know, in the role as a transport um, planner from, from your perspective, what was the are, are there ways and, and means um, that you know, parents pick up on there that um, local authorities can start in a smaller manner, um, trial and pilot, rather than trying to get everything perfect uh, and, and actually get some stuff out there so they can learn and understand? Is that is that a is that a, a strategy, if you like, that you would, from your perspective, you know, be encouraging people to look at? Absolutely. I think the the point of uh the government policy around having to have your strategy in place or a strategy in place or variation of a strategy in place uh paralyzes a little bit the rollout so because everybody's chasing the grant and i see a comment in the in the chat about grants driving behaviors and i i think that's the case and we know that the funding is not there sufficient for the need for local authorities so again officer time is taken up writing bids for a government grant that they're probably not going to get um but they feel they can't not bid for it um and uh, you know you've got grading now of scoring local authorities on their their capability capacity etc etc and anything below a certain mark, you still got to bid for it, but the, your chances are even significantly more reduced. So I think the challenge really is that if we look at purely the money that government has to put into this, we can't achieve it. So we've got to then clarify for local authorities or enable local authorities not to be paralysed by having to have all the ducks in the road for a government grant if the marketplace is what's going to drive their their delivery of of charges um but then you've got the challenge that that officers and experience and, and elective members anxieties or whatever around having all those ducks in a row can then confuse the decision as to which way do you go and i think there is this this approach where we need to in the discussions show that there is it doesn't have to be black and white that can be a, a development and evolution of your strategy at the same time as implementing some charges uh, went through whatever means that be. Um, and I think there are other challenges as well. And, and this hasn't come up yet. I think one of the charges, one of the points was the car may be in the bay, but is it actually charging? Um, and more often than not, you come across charger points where the person, you know, it is a diesel van or a, or a petrol car or a diesel car or whatever that's sat in there and they're parked because the car park is full and it's the only available parking space. And they take the risk that there's no enforcement upon them and <laughs> just park 
Um, and it's frustrating when you've only got about 10% left on your car and you're at a charger point and you've still got 100 miles to get home and you're looking for another charger point. Um, how we overcome that, and that's another thing that a local authority and their officers then have to consider a finite resource and a balance of the charger point rollout and the utilisation of the charger point rollout within the funding they've got available or within the within the strategy they've got against enforcement costs to manage those bays being available for the for the reason they're there as it were so i i do sympathize with the local authorities but certainly the conversations i i have with local authorities is yes do your strategy because it's a good thing to have but don't not do anything whilst you wait for your strategy to be delivered and, and work with the resource and trust the the industry to support and help you to evolve that process um, because there are there are there are parts of the country where there's an awful lot of charges but they were early adopters and the charges are three three and a half kilowatt charges and quite frankly they're pointless to me as a as an EV owner um, and so I don't tend to charge in those places and hope that I've got enough charge to, to get across the border where a later adopter has got a, a, a higher charge network. But those early adopters have got the challenge now of replacing all of their charger network, which needs to be done. And what's the contract arrangements? And that depends on what they started off with in the beginning. So challenges in terms of contract management for officers challenges in terms of strategy challenges in terms of time challenges in terms of the right thing challenges in terms of electricity supply you can see why it becomes more difficult for an officer to proceed on that but of course the message from us really is we're there to help we're there to to look at trying to find solutions to those challenges and moving it forward even if it's in an e evolutionary way Thank you, Roland. Um, Rosina, I mean, talk, we touched, Roland talked there on, on, on the aspects of sort of enforcement and how do you get the sort of, the, I guess, the carrot and stick in terms of making sure that, you know, to your point earlier, um, you're trying to encourage people, obviously, to, to, be, to be more active. Um, but how, how from, a, from a council perspective, are you trying to set out that, that right balance in terms of modal shift, but also then, um, if you like, uh, the carrot and stick approach, if you like, to, to, to enforcing where, where, where it's needed, um, EV charging bays or, or, or even the right behaviour in terms of getting people to do what you want them to do in terms of making that transition to net zero. Yeah, I mean, any behaviour change takes a lot, meaningful behaviour change takes a long time. We're not going to see, you know, a, a modal shift overnight, although, you know, during the pandemic, um, when you know a lot of uh, measures were put in, we we did see a shift, but obviously that's starting to to, to change. Where you know, because uh, we we were we were afraid that um, the that it would we'd see a car led recovery with people coming away from public transport. But now things have things are you know slowly getting back to normal, and people are using public transport more. And we're also finding um, that you know. You know, cycling levels have gone up and um, people are, are walking more but you know that there are there's there's still you know we still get i mean my inbox is still full of requests for you know uh you know when when are we getting a charging point here or you know there's some uh works going on on my estate doesn't it make sense you know while they're digging this you know this up that they put some you know uh the uh, the power um, cables in to put some uh, charging points in, and so those those conversations are being had um, at, at, at a very tactical level. But you know, it it takes time. It it, it takes time, and and but then we we don't have you know very long, um, less than seven years uh, to our you know to. to to be, you know, uh, net zero compatible by by twenty thirty. So I think there's going there's going to be a bit more of an acceleration, and we will start seeing more and more EV chargers of various um, levels, various speeds being rolled out. And you know, and I know, uh, you know, we we're going to be getting some out this year, um, and there'll be there'll be more coming out this year. So next year, so it's. I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, 
we'll be meeting demand, but I don't think we'll be able to keep everyone happy because we're not just going to, we're not going to be rolling out loads. I know some other boroughs are just like really throwing them out, but we're not, we're not doing that. Um, because, you know, we, we do want to make sure that um, people are, move away from the car because it goes back to the point I made earlier about reducing road danger, because that's, you know, we have a road danger reduction strategy, which we need to meet. Um, so yeah, it's, it's balancing all of that. Thank you. Uh, and we've just shared the the results of the last poll that we put out in terms of you know how long is it how long do you think it would take to to roll out EV infrastructure across the local authority and a overwhelming eighty four percent of you have come back to say more than twelve months. And I think that chimes with your point there, Rosina, which is you know as we look at you know we're we're almost in the middle of twenty twenty three. You know theoretically that the, the target was to achieve three hundred thousand by twenty thirty. Um, if it's going to, you know, if the, if the overwhelming perspective is it's going to take a long, longer than 12 months to roll out that infrastructure, I guess the, we're back to that key question, aren't we, is, is, you know, how do we expedite this? Yes, we've got the Levi funding come down, coming down the pipes, um, but, you know, how, how do we go quicker? Perrin, have you got any perspectives, and, and Roland, have you got any perspectives in terms of how we can sort of help accelerate local authorities on the journey uh, that they've got and, and, the, and, the, and the, the challenges they undoubtedly face? Yeah, I mean, look, we're not the only CPO in the market, but our model is built on the basis of our commercial model is built on the basis of, um, uh, of putting in the right charge points in the right location. So we offer all speeds of charge point, um, but we also, if those charge points aren't being used, we're not making money. So I've seen lots of comments in the chat about pricing. Uh, modeling and pricing and and uh, the right speeds and charge points going in um, ultimately a uh, private operator like ours if we're too expensive people aren't going to use our charge points you know we have to be competitive uh, on on pricing so um, we we model specific areas looking as I mentioned earlier at uh, dwell time at what you know what the local usage is going to be what the, we, we, we have a whole pricing uh, focus to make sure that we're competitively priced. So our model is such that we put the right charge points in the right locations at the right prices, because if we don't, our model doesn't work. Now, we're not the only provider in the marketplace doing this, but really there's a huge opportunity for models like this to help accelerate the process and at zero cost to the taxpayer. So we don't rely on any Levi funding. We, 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 um, install, operate and, and maintain it at our, at our cost. Uh, and that's why we look at long term relationships with local authorities. As I say, we're not the only player in the market. I'm, I'm just explaining how one of the ways that we can we can move on very quickly. Now, there are um, uh, a number of local authorities that do have already have allocated Levi funding. And we know that there's a round of Levi funding coming through. Um, so we, you know, we'll work with Levi funding or without Levi funding. So, uh, and, and that's my point about making sure that while you're writing your strategy, while you're applying for Levi funding, while you're getting a decision on Levi funding, don't stop the process, do some trials, do some pilots, do some testing so that when you've got your strategy in place, you've got your Levi funding, you can then make informed decisions rather than at that point saying, right, what do we do now? Who's the right CPO for us? And really, that's it's just a question of making sure that we're using the time right now to make sure we're going through the process of learning and understanding so that when we're ready to move, when local authorities are ready to move, they're moving from a place where they're already informed about where they want to go. Um, and, and that's a great way of accelerating this. And it's a, it's a way available right now. And we're working with lots of local authorities across the UK who are doing this. Excellent. Um, Roland, any perspectives that uh, to, to add on to that? Yeah, so I think it's about building a relationship and partnership between the EV company and the local authority officer so that the 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 both parties understand the challenges and the opportunities, but a certain amount of support can be given to overcome some of the challenges around um, traffic regulation orders, uh, planning. relationships etc etc and the expertise not being seen by the officers as purely their responsibility that it's that, that, that there is the expertise out there and that can be brought in to to support it i know tro's for instance uh, my experience is that um, orders staff have reduced significantly within a lot of local authorities and subsequently their 
the demand on their time is is greater but if orders are required for a for a location and a sighting of a bay or a or, or a um charger unit and a bay then actually the writing of the orders the generating of the orders can be done by somebody else effectively but then reviewed by the officer and and signed off effectively in that sense and and it's working in that way a little bit more sharing the load a little bit more um understanding the pressures and constraints but understanding the process that the officer's got to go through internally in terms of their governance and crossing the t's and dotting the i's to take some of the pain away okay thank you for, for that roland i think um we talked a, a little bit um it's come up a couple of times in terms of dnos and grid connections peter you mentioned it as as part of the the journey you've been on um you know, you've potentially found an ideal location, but then it's come a cropper because power capacity hasn't been there. Um, as you sort of uh, get to the the end of your your illustrious tenure at Croydon, are there any sort of any sort of key points you'd share, and any sort of wishes that you would share uh, with the rest of the uh, the cohort here in terms of you? If you had a magic wand, what would you do to try and make grid connections easier, quicker, simpler? Cool. What would I do to make con grid connections easier, easier, quicker? Um, I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that um, because I know we're, we're, we have had some meetings with UK Power Networks, our DNO, um, and you can be given access. That They have a lovely app that allows you to see where the, the substations are and how much power is available. Uh, don't be fooled um, because uh, they made it clear that particularly if it came to looking to any on-street rapid charging points, so 50 kilowatt um, units. Uh, it's not just the proximity of the substation uh, and the amount of power available in the substation, it's which direction the cables with the sufficient power happen to be running out of that substation. Because as the council, you could happily say, oh, we're going to put it down here. But the cables with the available power are going in the other direction. So communication is key. Um, for most of our seven kilowatt units, that hasn't been a problem. We had one of the, the Liberty Charge, I believe ones, where everything was fine and then ended up with the installation having started and the power was on the other side of the road. So headaches do happen. And that, I think, was the DNO's fault, not the charge burn operator or the council. Um, <laughs> so that leads me to conclude that you have to have that sublime mix of patience and persistence. I was about to swear there. Um, <laughs> sure and, 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 and flexibility. If it doesn't work in one place, you look around the corner, you look down the road. Um, but always focus on where your resident need is. I've, I've got one location at the moment, it's pretty near a Believe installation, um, but it's a taxi driver and he's causing a lot of grief to his neighbours putting a cable across the road. Um, and he says, but the four bays at the top of the road are too busy. Um, the next best but there's on curb parking in this road the next best location is kind of down the road and around the corner um, so whenever i get a request i capture the personal details on one spreadsheet on the other i look at well where am i actually going to be able to put the charging point and which one is the best solution um, uh, so where I say I'm led by requests, it's not blindly saying um, it's 75 Haven't Road, I'm going to put it outside 75 Haven't Road. It, it might be at 10, you know, Portsmouth Road around the corner. Um, and, and I guess it's that decision. And yeah, and I, guess it's, I, I guess it's that. It's that, that, that. And I guess it's that uh, that ability to have multiple options, isn't it? Just because, as you say, you've identified one particular postcode where you think there's there's demand because of a taxi driver or, or, or whatever. It's about not so much creativity, but but 
but knowing that that's the ideal location, but actually what are the what are the fallback second and third options if if the power is an issue or if the, the path yeah. isn't wide enough or all the other issues that we know and love in terms of trying to get that infrastructure rolled out. <laughs> Um, including, of course, you know, residents who are who are not so keen to have a charge point outside the house or, or whatever else. And I think that's always been, I think, one of my key reflections over the last four and a half years for local authorities is you're you're in you're in a almost an unmanageable, unwinnable situation. Rosina, back to the point you're making, you're never going to make everyone happy because you know I'm very much of the opinion that clearly most the vast majority of households today don't have an electric vehicle. So if you knock on the door and say, door and say, would you like an, a, an EV charge point outside your house? You know. 95% of them who don't drive an electric vehicle will turn around and go, well, no, of course, I don't have an electric vehicle, so I don't need one. Mm -hmm. If we wind forward, hopefully, five years, four years, maybe even three years, and we've got more electric vehicles on the road, and you and you knock again on that residence door, they'll be knocking on Rosina's door saying, well, actually, I do want a charge point outside my house. And you've got this, you've got this paradox, you, you know, you've got this pendulum swing, haven't you? At the moment, it's, I don't want charge points, you know, I haven't got a car, doesn't matter. And it's going to swing the other way, and you've got to try and make sure it's almost the the juggling act, Peter, that you've been doing over the last couple of years is trying to make sure you get the infrastructure in place before it's just before it's needed, just in time delivery, so that you give people the confidence that actually the infrastructure is there and now they can go and move to an electric vehicle. Conscious we've only got a short period left uh, of this, so let's uh, move into sort of some uh, closing comments and sort of feedback in terms of, you know, really trying to answer this question about how do we help um, and, and try and manage our way through the, 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 the strategy and, and deployment of EV charging points. And I guess um, coming back to each of you and, and sort of asking for some closing comments in terms of, you know, as you look back on uh, you know, our discussion today, but equally your experiences, what are the, what are the key couple of things that you'd be sharing um, with colleagues on the call? Perrin, maybe you can start with you. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about the, 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 the plethora of challenges and barriers in, in our way to developing this, this, this infrastructure that, you know, whether we like it or not, it's going to happen, it must happen. Um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, quite positive about the future. Um, I think that there are, um, uh, we're already seeing um, some, some changes in behaviour. Uh, we're seeing infrastructure being rolled out, albeit not fast enough, uh, frankly. Um, and we are, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, engage, engagement with, with local authorities increasing. Um, and we're also seeing uh, a lot of local authorities who are um, with limited time, and I come back to this challenge of limited time, who are using that time very effectively. Um, they're challenging their charge point operators to support where they can possibly support uh, and learning about uh, what's required in their local, lo local authority area. Um, to make sure that the, that the rollouts can be uh, relatively seamless, they're never going to be completely seamless, uh, and they're getting it right first time. Um, the you know the, the the one thing that I would suggest is 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 to make sure that you're engaging uh, with specialists in the industry, um, explaining the challenges that you that you have locally, and challenging your you know your the, the, the specialist providers to come up with solutions. Now, at the moment, we are still in the kind of slightly, you know, one man in the kingdom of the blind because there are a number of, of uh, solutions that are coming out that, uh, that are frankly really worryingly, uh, I'd say, dangerous and, and, and can cause challenges. And, and it's picking through that, uh, that very difficult um, uh, kind of forest of, of, of knowledge to work out what's right for you. And what I would, what I would suggest to local authorities is try and find um, uh, specialists in this field who aren't selling you one solution for one place. Look at look at providers or specialists who are offering uh, a range of different options and looking at a blended approach for your for your own local authority area. I think coming back to to a point that Rosina said very early on, this is not about a panacea. This is about one element of a much broader transport strategy that is entirely aimed on reducing CO2 emissions and our effect on, on climate change. Um, but we need to move fast, you know, we, we can't hang around, um, not just in terms of the 2030 date, but in terms of, of, of uh, CO2 and, and, and the climate crisis that we're facing. Um, so I would, I would ask local authorities to engage with us or, or anybody else and, and, and ask us questions. We may not know the right answer, but we'll certainly point people in there in, in the right direction um, of, of, um, of, of people who can support. Excellent. Rosina, closing thoughts from your side? 
Yeah, I mean, just to, again, echo what uh, what Perrin said, you know, our position in Lambeth is that, uh, you know, electric vehicles aren't a panacea and we don't consider them a silver bullet for tackling climate change. But, you know, we want to make sure that people who need to drive um, can charge their vehicle conveniently and reliably and uh, can access them. And the, the other thing I, I just I noticed in the, in the live chat, actually, people talking about car clubs. That's that's another important issue as, as well, that we want to make sure that any car clubs that we have in Lambeth, uh, we want to make sure they're all electric ones. Um, because that's another way of getting people away from car ownership and just yep. being able to use an electric vehicle when they need to do, don't need to own a car. You've got one on your street. Just use that. So that's, again, another part of our strategy as well. So hopefully with car clubs, uh, they will come with their own charging points, too. Excellent. Thank you. Roland, you've got less than two minutes for your, your, your summary comments. Um, support local authorities in terms of officer time simplify processes for people and um, get the data to ensure that it's the right right charger in the right place. If we can have some level of um, marketing around that, that encourages people to use them sensibly and appropriately and not chog them and or not bark on them, but that's human behaviour. So there's a certain amount of human behaviour factor in it. But quite frankly, um, I would implore local authorities not purely to depend on government funding that's coming through or look at government funding as the panacea to their net zero problem because it ain't going to happen, is my, is my view. Excellent. Peter, I'm, I've saved you up for last. Um, <laughs> a, a, because um, you know, we're really appreciative that on your last day um, you, you've, you, you've taken time out to spend it with us and, and certainly from, I'm sure, the vast majority of people on this call um, wish you a very happy retirement um, Thank you. and all the best in the next phase and chapter of your life. Um, I, certainly from the work we've done over the past couple of years, really appreciative of, of what you've done, what you've achieved. Um, and so well done from that perspective. Uh, any final any final comments from you, Peter? You can you can have the floor for the final final part of the webinar. <laughs> I, I should have written a speech, shouldn't I? Um, <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I guess the key thing is not just to focus on the EV charging strategy. You've got to go back to the sustainable transport strategy and be promoting all types of travel, uh, cycling, walking, you know, public transport, as well as car clubs, as we, we've been saying, uh, and then look at what your charging needs are. You can talk to similar councils is a good place to start. Um, charge point operators will come and have a look for you as well. Um, or you know, if you need to go to a consultancy, then there's good ones who will assess your needs. But whatever route you go down, generate an EV strategy that's good enough to start. Um, I think there is a need for a UK-wide um, and regional uh, strategy to address some of the bigger pictures, uh, the vehicle to grid, um, other electricity generating, but as an individual council, you've got to start somewhere. Um, invite requests from businesses and residents. Um, and as people have been saying, that business charging is pretty important where there's a high level of commuting. Um, and finally, yeah, the support is not to me just office of time, it's also having enough people with enough expertise. Um, and providing training and support. And that's not just to the EV person, but the people in parking and highways as well. Um, and it's been good to see in the poll that councillors, members, the politicians seem to be supportive, but they do need to understand uh, what's happening and the fact that we don't all have the right answers yet. Um, but the, uh, the EVs are coming. Um, and they're a good part of the solution. They're not the only solution. Excellent. Well, I think um, that's a, a, a very good summary, Peter. I'm not sure I could do any better job than that of summarising the, the, the brief <laughs> hour we've shared together. But uh, on behalf of everyone, look, thank you to all of my panel members today, to Rosina, to Roland, to Peter and to Perrin for sharing your time, your thoughts and your insights. Uh, I'm sure, like all the other things, this is just another part of that jigsaw where we collaborate, come together, share information and insights. 
learn from each other and, and hopefully help each other to accelerate on this journey because uh, as we've all said in the process today you know not only is achieving net zero is critical but fundamental in terms of um, you know making sure we've got cleaner air for all um, in our in the communities in which we operate i think is equally fundamental um, so i wish you all well in your journeys on on the electric vehicle uh, revolution uh, thank you again for your time and uh, look forward to the next time take care everyone thank you Cheers. Thank, thank you, you. thanks bye